Hi, Smart Pack fans. I'm Smart Packer Sarah, and this is Dr. Lydia Gray, Smart Pack's staff veterinarian and medical director. And we're back with another episode of Ask the Vet. As always, we're asking the questions submitted by you, our fabulous subscribers and viewers and fans, and then voted on by you as well. And of course, the questions that we answer uh, all get to get a Smart Pack gift card. They do? They do. That's great. But only if they reach out to us. Right. And some of you have not reached out for your gift cards. Shocking. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if they're like hiding from the government or <laughs> like, I don't know what, in what world. Taxes. You don't want a gift card. Yeah. I, you, it's, I it's a know. it's a good deal. So looking at you Instagrammers in particular, if you want to reach out to us for your gift cards, just email customercare at smartpack.com. Super easy. Without further ado, let's find out who's getting gift cards this time That's around. That's right, yeah. And four out of the five have already had a question answered previously. So they're getting it. So we got a lot of repeats, nice. which is awesome. I hope they're combining their gift cards to get something even more awesome. Bigger, bigger That's right. Uh, so question number one asked by Maria on the form at smartpack.com slash ask the vet questions. And Maria's wondering, uh, so she's previously had a question answered about straw bedding. And I remember so, that one. Yeah, okay. So okay. that was a good one. We get to talk a lot about thoroughbreds, which we always love. <laughs> and Maria is now wondering this time, what exactly is a bowed tendon? What causes a bowed tendon? What's the rehab protocol? And what are the effects on future soundness or any athletic restrictions? Yeah. Kind of another thoroughbred question because yeah. we think of bowed tendons in racehorses. The horse I had before Newman was a racehorse from the track, and I got him because he had a bowed tendon. So it's very classic. So we should talk about what it is because that's kind of a, a layman's term and nickname. Sure. And it's the uh, it's a breakdown in tissue of the superficial digital flexor tendon. Yeah. Um, and Easy that, for you to yeah, and I practiced. <laughs> and that runs uh, on the back of the leg, the cannon, from the knee to the ankle. Mm -hmm. And it's the outermost tissue that you'd find. It's the skin and then the tendons right there. And that breakdown, the injury can happen anywhere on the length of the leg. And it can happen the, the whole length of the leg. It's really bad. So um, she asked, what causes it? And it can be from one misstep mm -hmm. or can be from a, a accumulation of sort of wear and tear and you know poor conformation uneven footing um, not being trained or conditioned or fit for the activity that you're doing um, perhaps improper stressful shoeing yep could put additional yep. strain just your foot the balance and the angles not being right mm -hmm. um, it's it's unbalanced loading of that tissue. I mean, it's tendon, it's um, strong elastic tissue, but it has limits of how much, how elastic it is and how strong it is. I mean, I think just like the, the word you're using to describe it, elastic, you mm -hmm. can stress elastic too much and you can break it. Right. And you know, this is exactly the same and thing it, we're talking about. And so it can, it can be damaged, it can be stretched, but no actual fiber tearing. Mm -hmm. It can have a little bit of tearing or it can tear completely. So there's a range of injuries that can be involved. And the way you know that is a little bit the sign. So it's, it's the heat, um, swelling, mm -hmm. and, some, and pain. But sometimes these horses can even have pretty severe uh, bows and not be lame. Mm. But if you have the, the heat, the, pain, the swelling, especially in that leg, it just doesn't look or feel right because you're always palpating your horse's legs right before and after rides, you should contact your vet because not only will they palpate it with more expert fingertips, but they have the ultrasound. And the ultrasound is the best way to assess the damage because they can look inside at the quality of the fibers themselves, look for any uh, core lesions or areas where the, the fibers are completely separated and, and um, inflammatory fluids, blood and cells have, have filled in the gaps. And that ultrasound, so that now let's move into the rehab part of it, mm -hmm. is useful about every mm, four to six weeks or a month or every two months as you're rehabbing. And while I would love to give you a rehab protocol, um, it all depends on your horse and what caused the injury and um, how what's available to you. Like if you have an underwater treadmill, super, but not everybody does. Um, it, and it, it depends on, I mean, just the, the nature of the injury. So if it's a really severe injury, it's going to take a long time. I will say this. One thing we learned in, we learned a lot of things in vet school, but one thing about this was, <laughs> You're so yeah, um, people think of fractures, 
bones as being really bad, terrible, the worst thing that can happen. Actually, because what we were talking about before, the nature of the, the cells and the elasticity of the tendon, that the soft tissue, the tendons and the ligaments are worse. Mm. And they gave us a rule of thumb that the length, the number of letters in the word is how long, how many months it takes to heal. Ooh. So bone, help me out here, oh, B-O-N-E, right. And then tendon is six. Okay, six, thank and you. And ligament. Is more than yeah. six. So these can sometimes take, tendons and, and ligament injuries can sometimes take six months, eight months, a year before the horse is returned to normal. And then we have the question of, are they ever gonna to return to normal? Right. Some do, some don't. Nowadays we have, in addition to the great imaging with the ultrasound, so we know what's going on, and you can, you can sonogram that tendon before you start the next phase. So first it's stall rest, and then hand walking, and then um, uh, under saddle work or, or tack riding under tack, and then you, you add in trotting, and you add in cantering, and you also have to consider your um, circles and corners and transitions, all those things can be stressful on mm -hmm. soft tissues. Uh, but before you increase the plane of exercise, you can sonogram and see how well the tissue is healing and, and restructuring. Is it organized or is it haphazard, which mm -hmm. would be bad. Um, so in addition to advanced imaging, we also have um, like shockwave therapy. Regenerative medicine has proven fantastic for healing of tendons. And that's things like um, stem cells and PRP and IRAP that you can inject right in there. But I mean, there's, there's laser therapy, there's the TENS, there's um, uh, massage and, and then heat once it's in the further stages. So there's lots of techniques that you'll, you'll want to talk to with your veterinarian in addition to the time frame and what you should be doing activity-wise at each week, what additional modalities can be added on to um, encourage the normal healing. And also having the um, building blocks of normal tissue available when they need to heal is really super important. So this is something you'll want to work closely with your veterinarian in their rehab. When you talk about the building blocks of normal tissue, if we're talking about a bowed tendon, for example, what are some of those things that you might look for to be supplying that horse with? Well, I think the number one thing, because this is what it's made of, is collagen. Mm -hmm. And the collagen is protein, it's amino acids, and so you, you want to have that there really for any healing process, but for soft tissue, for tendons and ligaments, that's extraordinarily important. Um, and then there's some other, some minerals. Um, you can have some agents that just promote or support normal inflammation. Like you want some inflammation, but you don't want excessive inflammation. So things, things that might help the horse be more comfortable, especially in that stall rest portion, mm -hmm. you know, where they're stuck inside. And, and so um, things like, uh, like Devil's Claw or Yuck or Boswell, all those things that sort of manage the, the tissues and the fluids normal response would be helpful. Um, so if you guys are dealing with a horse who has um, that kind of a situation and you're in that sort of situation, as you're working with your veterinarian, we do have some supplements that contain things mm -hmm. like collagen or supportive ingredients for horse on stall rest, including calming, which I think we yeah. can all agree yeah. is uh, a little bit helpful when you're dealing with that. So yeah. um, you're always welcome to call our customer care team. Our supplement experts would be happy to help give you some options to talk with your vet about. One thing you talked about in that response that I just want to touch on is okay. if you would show show your hands, palms up, you can see the difference. She has expert fingertips, <laughs> and I have very novice <laughs> fingertips, and you can very clearly tell the difference. That, that's why you're so good at the palpation, uh. and I'm just I'm just you know a layman. Gotcha. I, I love it. I think it I think that is one of the things. I like when you said you learned one thing in vet school. I learned like, one oh, well, thing in vet school. Like, many things. 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 Yes. <laughs> Expert fingertips and then the number of letters yep. in the word. Yep. Never At least you that. don't have to count superficial or deep digital flexor tendon because <laughs> all those letters. That's a lot. That's yeah. a long time. Maybe that's, maybe that's the weeks. <laughs> oh, that's fair. All right. Question number two submitted by Louise H. on YouTube. And this is Louise's, how many times do you think she's on? Well, second, based on what you said earlier. At least second. Oh, at least second. Yeah, her fifth win. Oh, my gosh. We could okay. do an entire episode of Louise's questions. She's going to earn herself a free saddle. It's true. <laughs> she's working towards it. Right. Um, so she's previously had questions answered on uh, when to geld a stallion, locked stifles, corn oil, and wolf teeth. So oh. interesting. So she feels like her theme is maybe some young horse stuff yep. with the gelding and the wolf teeth. Mm -hmm. um, so her question now is, can mares in heat 
Okay, so maybe she is in a breeding program. Can mares in heat have symptoms similar to colic? If so, is there anything I can give my mare to reduce pain? Um, I've, I've always had geldings. <laughs> is that by choice? Yes. <laughs> um, I just, uh, mares, what I hear is that if you get a good one, they, there is nothing like a good mare. I've heard that too. But They'll I just, try, your, their, yep, try their heart yeah, out exactly. for you. Yeah, exactly. But I just, I travel too much and I'm too busy that in that, that week where they're in heat is all, probably the week I'm home or the week I have a show and I just can't deal with it. So um, the, the short answer to your question is yes, colic-like signs can be something that mares show when they're under the influence of estrogen and in estrus and having their heat. Um, they can have a, a wide range of, of signs. I think most owners and veterinarians agree. In fact, there was a survey that said the main sign they show when they're, when they're cycling is um, an attitude or behavior change. Mm -hmm. So I think 90% of people said they checked that box. <laughs> yep, but certainly abdominal pain can be something, back pain, um, it's, it's sort of referred pain, right, because it's their reproductive tissue, mainly their ovaries, that, that are hurting at this time. Um, so what I'm guessing is she's got a, a mare that is intermittently or recurrently painful, mm -hmm. colicky. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. How does she know it's because of heat cycles mm -hmm. and not because it's sand, because mm. sand causes recurrent colic? Um, could be gastric ulcers, could be interlis. Um, you know what I'm going to say next because if I have a horse that is doing something and not quite sure what it is and I want to talk to my vet but I don't have my facts yet so I'm going to start recording it. I want to keep a journal. Bing, bing, bing. Winner hair gift card for you. Um, <laughs> so it will be really helpful to your vet because that's the very next thing she should do. She says, "What? if so, what should I do? Talk to your vet because your vet's gonna wanna assess your horse when you see these colicky signs because they can go in there and say there's a giant follicle that is probably painful mm -hmm. or they can, they can follow her heat cycle around with those expert fingertips and right. ultrasound, which yeah. seems to be the theme of, of this, this uh, episode. So far. Yeah, right. Um, once you have recorded facts and your veterinarian has done an exam and you guys figured out, yep, it's, it's a, of a reproductive nature or it's not, then you can take actions to manipulate mm -hmm. the, the cycle. And by that, you can um, prevent it completely. You could shorten it. Um, but there's, there's hormone therapy that can be given uh, either orally or injectable. There's even some long-acting injections that can um, keep mares out of heat completely or make it more... Um, regular and consistent and predictable and, and hopefully um, more comfortable and, and pain-free. So there are some things you can do, but the point is you have to make sure that it's reproductive first because it could be some other things. And so that journal that you keep and then having your vet look, and, and it might require multiple visits to figure this out um, would, would be the, the two steps I would do. Okay. Good luck, Louise. We hope to see you again next time. <laughs> For a sixth one. Right? Uh, so question number three submitted by Kim on the Ask the Vet form. She's also formerly asked a question about what to look for in an individual box stall. And this time she is asking, I have seen riders get on and walk their horse for half a lap around the ring before putting them right to work. I, first of all, I love that, that intro too, sentence. Yeah. Is this uh, just asking for an injury? What's the proper way and length of time to warm up a horse, particularly before taking a jumping lesson? Okay. Also, my horse spends most of her day in a stall. Does she need even more warm up time? Oh, great question. Really good questions. So, thank you. Now I get to talk about my favorite book. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this is Conditioning Sport Horses by Dr. Hillary Clayton. What I'm not going to do is turn the book around. Uh, and show you her picture okay. because she Fair. would kill me because <laughs> um, it's from a long, long time ago and she doesn't look like that anymore. She has a much better haircut. Um, <laughs> it's very, it's very period-based haircut. <laughs> it's very 80s. <laughs> so, but it's a fantastic book and I, I'm actually going to quote some things right from it because it's so good. But her first question was, is this asking for an injury? Yes. 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 Yes is the answer. Um, an effective warm-up enhances performance and reduces the risk of injury. So it's right there in black and white. Okay. Um, 
she also says during the warm-up the temperature of the muscles increases and it's beneficial because warm muscles not only contract more powerfully the fibers are more compliant or elastic mm -hmm. which reduces the risk of injury due to tearing of the fibers so how do you warm up knowing that yes you have to warm up longer and slower and more gentle if your horse is tall or older mm -hmm. another reason or it's cold mm -hmm. in cold weather your warm-up must be longer and using a quarter sheet is a really good idea because then it it gets the horse warmer faster so you can work say more safely um, but it could the, the walk on a, a long rein or free rein is a uh, the first step that you do and this could be anywhere from a few minutes if you pull a horse out from pasture to one like yours is stalled could be 10 or even 15 minutes mm -hmm. the next thing you do is an active trot or canter, you pick the gait that your horse is most comfortable and relaxed in. Mm -hmm. If your horse is going to fight you in the trot, that's not helping your warm-up because part of it is not only the physical benefits of the warm-up before work, but the mental benefits. Mm -hmm. So the whole body, head to toe, mind and body needs to be relaxed. So warm up at the active gait that they're going to be most ah, at, which might be canter for some horses. Um, then spoke says the dressage rider you get to your suppling work depending on what you're doing you sound like a hunter jumper so you're not going to have from me as much um, as as i as i do but you can leg yield you can shoulder forward shoulder right you can do circles changes of direction serpentines get the horse bending and moving and, and loose and goose and front and back and then and then you go right to your work and what that means is your her, hers is a jumping lesson she wants mm -hmm. specific guidance for okay the advice is from your warm-up, add on segments of the work that you're going to do that day, the training or the schooling, but in, in um, less difficult, less strenuous um, version. So if she's going to jump, let's say, two foot six, then start by doing poles on the ground mm -hmm. and then add an 18-inch cross rail. So you gradually build up to your work. So you don't go from the, the walk and the active trot and even the suppling work right to the two six fence. So, and then, and then she's, so, so, so she's a jumping lesson person. Yep. But if you're a dressage person or you're a rainer, you would follow the same protocol. You would leave the warm up. You don't even know, the horse doesn't know, you know. It's that gradual. And you build in, you layer in the work that you're gonna be doing until you eventually get to your peak. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have the warm down mm -hmm. so there's the the warm-up and the work warm down cool down mm -hmm. so your four segments but she's absolutely right though the goal is to reduce injury enhance performance so and I think there are at least in my experience there are safer shortcuts that you can take and then there are some less good options so I think a lot of people think like oh if my horse needs to move around a lot before I ride I should just lunge him it's going to depend on how your horse is on the lunge line. If he's wild, he's Excellent not warming up slowly. Yep. Um, he's warming up very, very aggressively. Yeah. Um, and so some of the other shortcuts you mentioned, the quarter sheet, mm -hmm. there are also some therapeutic leg wraps because certainly the legs have a lot of those tendons mm -hmm. and ligaments that we worry about being a little bit less elastic yep. when you start doing your work. And so some of those um, therapeutic products that can warm up the legs with things like ceramic, um, Smart Pack carries a lot of those, so if you guys ever are wanting to look for things that can particularly help you in the winter, mm -hmm. when you're not very eager to spend 15 minutes casually walking around the ring, um, some of those can be good options. So our fourth question was a first time winner, very exciting, Amy Bergender on Instagram. You better email in for your gift card. Don't be one of those other Instagrammers who just asks a question and then leaves us. Amy is wondering, I keep hearing about the importance of having hay tested so you know the nutrition content. I think she means she keeps hearing that from you <laughs> because we do talk about that quite a bit. How do you interpret the results of a hay analysis? Oh, and then she says, thank you for all the videos. They're super informative and helpful with two little heart emojis. I think you're the big one and I'm the little one because <laughs> okay. you're doing more of the work. <laughs> okay. And I'm just over here <laughs> making dad jokes. Um, well, I, I, like, I like the fact that she's noticed that there's several of us out there saying hay analysis is important. Yes. Um, I think the thing that I neglected to mention was that it's a great, while it's a great idea to get a hay analysis, there, 
They're very challenging to read. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't read my own, but I send it to a nutritionist. I give it to the people who formulate our um, ration balancer. Um, I work with Feed Excel, mm -hmm. plug it right in there, and even talk to some local vets. So, hey analysis, and I'll go through some terms here, and then you'll see, you'll be like, oh, I don't <laughs> want to do this, but <laughs> still have it done, but then go to an expert to have it interpreted and to use it. So there's, there's a couple things that you can look at it and you'll want to pick out and go, oh, this and that, but for the most part, the really nitty gritty detail stuff, leave it to the experts to do. Yeah, so um, things you'll see on there, you'll see dry matter versus as fed or as sampled, and that's just the, the moisture content. So the dry matter has the water pulled out, and that's the more um, apples to apples number that we like to compare between feeds. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the one that, that you'll want to look at. The digestible energy, which is often abbreviated to DE, that is just the um, after the horse, so some of it is gonna get used by the horse and some of it is gonna get pushed on through and not used by the horse. And so the DE is the part that's used by the horse, the energy or the calories. You'll see cr crude protein in a percent, and that's an estimate actually of the protein based on the nitrogen levels. What it doesn't tell you, is the hay analysis is fascinating because it tells you a lot and it doesn't tell you a lot. Mm -hmm. It sometimes it's raises, very coy. It raises more questions than <laughs> answers. But it, it tells you the quantity of protein, but not the quality. Oh, sure. Yeah. So we care about the quality. So while it's handy to know, do I have an 8% uh, pr crude protein at your SA, or do I have a 12%, and then I know, do I need a multivitamin, mm -hmm. or do I need to step up to a ration balancer that also includes protein, it doesn't tell you the the specific amino acids mm -hmm. that are in the protein, and that's really handy. Um, crude fat, crude fiber, a lot, I think a lot of people that have um, horses that are easy keepers, that have um, equine metabolic syndrome, Cushing's disease, they're concerned about the sugar. These fiber numbers are where they focus a lot of their attention, and I'm actually gonna use my paper for this, because if I get this wrong, it's really bad, and somebody will tell me. So. Um, You'll see things like ADF and NDF, and that stands for acid detergent fiber and neutral detergent fiber. That's somewhat helpful. It mostly tells you the, the quality of the forage um, based on its when it was cut, its level of maturation. Mm -hmm. So the older, hay, the older, the longer plants grow before they're cut, the more mature they are, the higher those two numbers will be, and they're, then they're considered to be a bulkier, more straw-like hay. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're stemmier and harder to get nutrition out of, yeah. right. Um, that's, so those are the structural carbohydrates, the, the, the cell wall, what allows plants to stand up straight. The non-structural carbohydrates are what people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so we have simple sugars. And the other word for them, the fancy word that you'll see on your hay analysis is ESC or ethanol soluble carbohydrates. Okay. I can tell you for this segment, the screen is going to be full yeah. of numbers and Because ESCs figures. are an NSC, which is different than the ADF and the NDF. And WSC. We haven't even got to WSC yet. We got a lot of things right. going on. So when you add simple sugars and fructans, you get the WSC. Mm -hmm. And when you add starch to that, you get the NSC. Okay. So see how it got complicated. The important thing is when you get to um, those numbers, those ESCs, WSCs, and NSCs, they should be a less than 10 to 12 percent okay. if you have one of those horses I mentioned earlier mm. where you're watching the sugar. Mm -hmm. If not, then and this is the main reason a lot of people analyze their hay, and you can just order a package that has this. You don't have to have everything else. You can soak your hay. Mm -hmm. um, not rinse it, soak it like for 30 minutes in hot water and 60 minutes in cold water. Not steam it. It's different. Um, there is some benefit to steaming, but it's different. And they're, they, they're beginning now to show that there's some benefit to reducing the carbohydrate load in steaming, but soaking is still the preferred method. Right. Yeah. Steaming better generally for reducing dust. For breathing for issues. Right, exactly. Like yeah. Um, so that's the carbohydrate. That's really important for those kind of horses. And then I think the other reason that people analyze their hay is to know the minerals. Mm -hmm. So one thing is to know, are you getting hay that's um, low or high in selenium? Do, so do I have to supplement that? Because it's got a narrower window 
between the minimum and the maximum than some others, but not scarily so. I'm not sure if that's the word, scarily, but anyway. Um, and then you want to look at your macro minerals like calcium and phosphorus. And mm -hmm. haze will always be more calcium than phosphorus, but it's handy to know the absolute number as well as the percentage at ratio. It should be, it should be um, somewhere between one and a half to one parts calcium to parts phosphorus to two to one. Mm -hmm. So always higher in the calcium to phosphorus. What happens is if it's, if it's just on that one to one border and you add in some grain, which is higher in phosphorus, then you maybe have an inverted ratio and trouble ensues. So um, the macro and the, and the micro minerals are also important. But you know, you, if, you, if you subscribe to FeedXL, you just plug all this in and then they'll do the ching 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 math for you and it's, you get an answer and then you know, do I feed a multivitamin? Because here's, here's the bottom line. You want to use this to say, do I feed a multivitamin, a ration balancer, a fortified feed, a complete feed? And are there specific areas that I need to supplement mm -hmm. specifically? Or um, is, it, is this hay not good because it's got too much sugar? Right. Yeah. Those are the kind of things it tells you. But get some expert help to analyze it because it's hard. And then how often do you do them? Is If you get a new cut of hay, is doing it at the beginning fine? And you can assume that to be true for the life of that hay as you use it up in the barn. Yes. How often are you doing uh, hay analysis for Newman? Um, we we analyze each cutting mm -hmm. because each cutting is going to be different yep. and so um, probably three times a year we get we get a new batch in okay. and so that's how we do it and then we send that to the person that formulates our ration and he makes little adjustments okay terrific last but not least we have a question submitted by Michelle on YouTube and this is Michelle's third win, so congratulations, <laughs> Michelle. Third win. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And her previous questions were on how to tell if your horse is overweight and tips for a horse sensitive to bug bites in the summer. Okay. And today she is wondering, what are your thoughts on mowing pastures? Isn't it bad to leave grass clippings behind when mowing, especially if the horses go back in the pasture right away and eat them? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, this was really interesting because the day this came in, um, our pastures got mowed. So I was like, oh, I, I don't know, <laughs> what should I do? Quick, look at that. So um, what I found was grass or lawn clippings mm -hmm. are much different than pasture mowing. Okay. Because if you think about the machine you use to mow your lawn mm -hmm. versus the machine you use to mow your pasture, they produce very different leavings. I mean, we call them clippings because they're very, very short in a lawn, like an inch. And the pasture can be inches. It's mm -hmm. long stem. Mm -hmm. So that's one problem, one difference. I'll tell you my bottom line first and we'll come back and talk about it more, but you should not feed grass or lawn clippings, but it's okay to leave horses in pasture generally. When you, you they're used to it, you're mowing their pasture and you're leaving it in the rows to dry. Mm -hmm. If you have a horse that is um, prone to colic or laminitis or you're worried, then you know what? Mow them, take them off for the day, put them back on. Because, but once those um, trimmings are dried in the pasture, they're essentially hay, mm -hmm. right? That's how you make hay, you cut grass. It, but it's in the lawn when it's so much shorter and we tend to put it in bags mm -hmm. so we condense it. We tend to pile it or clump it. Um, all those things make it unsafe because um, it's too wet. Mm -hmm. If you put your hand in there, you feel how hot it is, right? It's already starting to ferment. So imagine the fermentation that's going on in your horse's digestive tract if mm -hmm. you feed that. And they eat them super fast because they don't have to mosey. They don't have to select. They don't have to tear. They just have to hoover. And so they get all that really short, dense, and, and long clippings are really high, excessively high in the simple sugars, mm. in the carbohydrates that are the, the bad kind. Um, it's like eating bread at a restaurant. Oh. You know, it comes first, it comes early, and you gobble all those rolls down. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what it's like. But then it's warm in the middle when you put your hand in, just it's like you're saying. It's warm in the middle, you know. So no on the lawn clippings, yes on the on the pasture. Um, and, and there's there's even more stuff. There's there's uh, mold can happen mm -hmm. that the grass clippings, the lawn clippings get uh, too much moisture. Um, 
they, in certain parts of the country that have um, botulism, that can form because it's a perfect environment. Uh, horses that eat too fast, eat those clippings, those short clippings too fast, can choke. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the main reasons that a lot of experts don't recommend grass or lawn clippings is that the risk of, oh, I'm going to also trim my bushes or trim this ornamental or whatever. And many ornamentals that are just fine and beautiful for yards are deadly to mm -hmm. horses. So you got to watch your neighbors too, not just you. Um, for that reason, experts just say, you know what, let's just hand hold, hold hands and agree we're not going to feed lawn clippings and any lawn waste to horses because it's just so unsafe to yeah. bundle up and say, here you go. This is not a good practice. Yeah. But mowing the pasture, generally speaking, generally, if your horse is used yeah. to it. it now be. mine still follows the brush hog and hoovers it up. So when we mow pastures, I do have to take mine out because he's like, loose grass. <laughs> um, and yeah, the work is already done. The work is done. And so that I don't, I don't want him eating that much wet grass that quickly, so I do remove him. Well, especially because you said, you know, it depends on the individual horse and mm -hmm. if you're concerned. And in your case, you're concerned because of his behavior. But mm -hmm. also, Sweet Newman has a history of colic. Right. And so that's something that you're particularly yeah. sensitive to. Yeah. Now, he wears a grazing muzzle, so it might be harder for him to pick it up. But knowing him, I think he's found a way yeah, he's got to, a to do it. He's got a technique. So I, I just don't trust him. And I pull <coughs> him. Okay. Well, that's all we have for this month. Thank you guys so much for submitting your questions. You can submit questions for the September episode on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, the blog, Twitter, or the form at smartpack.com slash askthevetquestions. You can ask your questions anytime, but be sure to use hashtag askthevetvideo so we can keep track of all those great questions. Anything we receive before August 2nd is eligible for the next video. Gotcha. And then you'll be able to vote on Twitter or YouTube or the blog. If your question was answered in this or a previous video, like we mentioned at the beginning, please email a customer care. We would love to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe and have a great ride.